So this is a case that I have seen come up time and time again over my years of looking into Australian true crime cases, but I've never really read into the full details of the crime. That was until last year when the New South Wales police released this oldish photograph from around the early 2000s of this unidentified man that apparently had some kind of connection to today's 1994 case that we're going to be discussing. And I'm going to put a little disclaimer in today's video, which I usually do not do because some of the people and the details that I read in relation to this case were kind of strange and scary, to be honest with you. So to cover myself, none of the information that I'll be discussing is my opinion nor unique to this video. It is simply information that I have compiled from free and readily available sources linked below. I am just a member of the public with a keen interest in true crime and nothing more. And I also do want to add that there was a lot of conflicting information uh, about this case out there. And while of course I've done my best to make this video as accurate for you as possible, there is always the chance of small inaccuracies. So Ravel Sabine Balmain was born on July 11, 1972 to her mother Jan and father Ivor Balmain. She also had a stepsister, Sue Ellen, who was a daughter from Jan's previous marriage and a brother, Matthew, who tragically died at just 15 months old in a swimming pool drowning. By 1994, 22-year-old Ravel was living in a unit with a flatmate in the suburb of Bellevue Hill, located just outside of the Sydney CBD in Australia. Ravel was working as a dancer, having been classically trained in jazz, classic and ballet, and was working as a model. And in fact, from what I can tell, she was becoming rather successful in her chosen profession or chosen professions. She had recently been featured on the cover of a popular fashion magazine here in Australia. I think it is just Australian, but anyway, it's called Oyster Magazine and it is still around, I believe, at least online. And Ravel was also about to head off for a six week trip to Japan to work as a hostess in what they call a hostess club in Japan. Now, I had never personally heard of a hostess club up until doing my research for this video, and I don't believe that we have anything that's even comparable here in Australia, so I will do my best to explain what I believe a hostess club is. So several articles refer to hostesses as the modern day geishas and basically their job is to entertain guests who are predominantly uh, Japanese male patrons by engaging in conversation, making them drinks and just generally paying them attention and quite frankly probably stroking their ego, let's face it. It is not a strip club and there is nothing sexual about it unless otherwise stipulated. And in fact, touching the hostesses is strictly off limits. And a hostess job is more often than not held by a beautiful foreign woman. And apparently it does pay rather well and the tips are incredibly generous. So it is somewhat of a coveted job, although from what I was reading, it isn't considered like a respected or respectful yeah, respected job in Japan and is generally not a job given to Japanese women as the patrons apparently find Japanese women too conservative. Again, I am going off articles I read online about this job, so correct me down below if I am wrong, but I actually do find the whole concept rather fascinating. I've never been to Japan myself, but I am pretty desperate to go. I've been wanting to go since like pre-pandemic. So hopefully in the future, I can make my way over to Japan. But if you've ever been there yourself, give me some uh, super touristy suggestions. I'd love to hear some. I need some ideas. I need, I need to plan a trip. Anyway, getting off track. So Ravel was described as bubbly, sociable, and a happy person that could easily engage in conversation with a stranger. And of course, she was obviously absolutely stunning. So this was somewhat the perfect job for Ravel. And around this time, she had also met a man who was working in the film industry named Piers Fisher Pollard. Piers, Piers, we know my pronunciation is rubbish by now. But anyway, 
He and Ravel really hit it off and had been dating for around six weeks by the time that she was about to head off to Japan. And Ravel was even telling friends that she was madly in love with Piers. However, Ravel had a secret. She was leading somewhat of a double life that she had been keeping a secret from her boyfriend, her family, and most of her friends. And I think it is fair to say that the entertainment industry is a pretty brutal and fickle one and dancing and modeling just don't always pay the bills. So on the side, Ravel was working as an escort for a high-end agency called Select Companions under the pseudonym Mishka. She considered this a temporary job though to make ends meet and in fact she had planned to quit doing this job around early November of that year just before her very exciting trip to Japan. But Ravel would never make it over to Japan. On the morning of Saturday, November 5, Ravel saw her boyfriend, Pierre's, before they parted ways at around lunchtime. After this, she had some appointments lined up through her escort agency, and later on, she had plans to meet up with her best friend, Kate Brentnell, for drinks at the Royal Hotel in Paddington. This day was also apparently meant to be her last ever day working as an escort before heading off on her trip. So, Ravel's first escort appointment was at 4pm in the suburb of Kingsford. The protocol back then, since mobile phones were not a thing, were for escorts to call the agency when they got to their appointment and when they left their appointment, so that the agency would know the girls had made it to their appointment safely and were leaving safely. At about 10 to 4, Ravel phones select companions and speaking to the receptionist, she tells them that she's made it to her first appointment of the day. This appointment was set to be two hours long from 4 till 6 p.m. and then her second and also her last appointment for that day was scheduled for 7.30 at the Swiss Grand Hotel in Bondi, which I believe is now the QT Hotel, which by the way, it's like a great hotel chain. But anyway, and this appointment happened to be with two good friends of the husband and wife team that ran Select Companions, Zoran and Jane Stanojevic. So Ravel, although Zoran would later say that she was not the most reliable escort, certainly was one of the most beautiful and most popular amongst clients. Therefore, she was sent to some of the more important appointments. But back to this 4 p.m. appointment. How many times am I going to say appointment in this video? Oh my goodness. Ravel met with a man, 26-year-old Gavin Owen Samer. So Gavin was an avid surfer who lived with his then girlfriend, Michelle Oswood Seely, who was away this particular weekend visiting family in Brisbane. So I guess Gavin decided this was an apt time to phone for an escort. He also, according to his girlfriend, sold her clarinet in order to pay for this appointment, but more on that later. So Ravel shows up for this appointment with Gavin with a bottle of champagne as requested by him, and two hours later she phones select companions to let them know that she is now leaving the Kingswood residence. However, according to Gavin, Ravel didn't actually leave his home at 6 p.m. What he says happened was that himself and Ravel entered into a private agreement where she would stay with him for an extra hour without informing her escort agency and he would pay her under the table, so to say, meaning her agency would not receive their cut from the client for that hour. This practice, which is incredibly frowned upon, as you can imagine, is called moonlighting. Uh, there's no proof this actually happened, of course, besides Gavin's word. So just after 7 p.m., Ravel makes a call to her friend, Kate, telling her that she couldn't talk right now, which Kate took to mean that she was busy with a client, but Ravel said that she would phone her when she got home about them meeting up for drinks afterwards. And this phone call would be the last that anybody ever heard from Ravel Balmain. After this phone call, Gavin says he dropped Ravel off at the nearby Red Tomato Inn before he purchased some cider and cigarettes for himself at the inn and headed home for the night. However, no one actually ever saw Ravel at this inn, nor did 
anyone see Gavin purchasing alcohol and cigarettes? And of course, with every true crime case, the security cameras were not working at this time. Shock horror. And also the red tomato in was kind of a bit of a run down joint. So a girl like Ravel, who was tall, standing at five foot eight and stunning, she quite frankly would have stood out like a sore thumb. But not one person recalls seeing her there that evening, nor is there any record at all of Ravel catching a taxi home from this location or not home, but anywhere to her next appointment, nowhere. And when Ravel doesn't show up to her 7.30 appointment, the agency simply sends out another escort because as I said, she was apparently not the most reliable escort the agency had, but one of the, one of the more popular ones. Kate also never hears from her friend again that night and Ravel's boyfriend, whom she had actually planned to meet up with at the end of her night, doesn't hear from her either. And it's not long before Ravel is reported as a missing person to the police by her boyfriend, Pierre's. The next day on Sunday, November 6, Ravel's mum, Jan, who she was incredibly close to, stood and waited at the Newcastle railway station for her daughter. The pair had plans to meet up for lunch and have a bit of a catch up before Ravel's big trip. And Newcastle, Newey, as the locals call it, shout out to any of my Newcastle viewers, is about a two, two and a half hour train ride north of Sydney. So it's certainly no quick little trip. However, Ravel was not on the train that she had told her mum she was going to be on, so Jan waits for the next one just in case. But again, Ravel wasn't on this next train either. And simply not showing up to see her mum was completely out of Ravel's character. So Jan phoned her daughter's housemate, whom had not seen her, uh, and after this, she starts ringing around to Ravel's other friends, but nobody had seen or heard from Ravel since Saturday evening. And Jan became even more concerned after hearing that Ravel had gone MIA on her best friend, Kate, the evening before. So Jan starts to ring around to local hospitals just in case her daughter has been in some sort of terrible accident. But again, she has no luck. And soon Jan reports her daughter as a missing person to the police. A few days after her disappearance, Ravel's family and her boyfriend would be shocked to learn that she had been leading a double life as an escort. On the Monday, as police began looking into Ravel's disappearance, they made a disturbing discovery. A number of items belonging to Ravel were found scattered through the streets of Kingswood, the suburb where her client, Gavin Samers, lived. They also found one of her shoes, a cork platform sandal with shells all over it, very 1994 indeed, in a bin close to Gavin's home, as well as her house keys, diary, and her handbag that had her passport and her ticket to Japan in it just littered through the streets of Kingswood. And neighbours also would tell police that they heard shouting at around 11pm on the evening of the disappearance. Unsurprisingly, Gavin was brought in for questioning that same day, where the police immediately noticed some scratch marks on his neck and hands. They soon also found some similar scratch marks on his chest. And I will insert a photo on the screen now if you want to have a look at these. Police, of course, did ask Gavin where he got the scratches, and he told them that they were just from a surfing incident the day before. He had got up quite early on the Sunday at around 5 a.m. and had been surfing. Investigators did also visit Gavin's home on several occasions, in fact, to have a look around, but they never did a proper forensic search of his residence. They basically just did a visual look around, lifting up items to look for anything like blood or any other similar evidence. They didn't even ask Gavin for the clothing that he had been wearing on the Saturday night. They just wanted his wet suit that he had worn surfing on the Sunday. And to add to the, quite frankly, crummy police work, investigators took eight 
days to confiscate and examine Gavin's car, in which time he had it cleaned, according to his girlfriend. Although Gavin was still considered a person of interest, with no solid evidence and the fact that this wasn't actually even being treated as a homicide investigation at the time, the police let him go. A few years later, Gavin would actually phone the agency, the escort agency, select companions again requesting an escort, but attempting to book it under a false name. And the agency actually recognized Gavin's home address and phoned the police. And when the police showed up to Gavin's house, they found him pretty drunk, which of course is not incriminating whatsoever, just a little odd. And of course, I'm not saying Gavin is involved. I'm just giving you the facts. So I think it's pretty bloody fair to say that Ravel Balmain's disappearance was not initially taken all too seriously by the police. I suppose from their point of view, she was a pretty young girl living it up in the big city that had a bit of a habit of flaking out on clients. And Let's face it, this would not be the first time that police did not take the disappearance of a sex worker very seriously. In fact, I can literally think of at least two cases off the top of my head where police have seemingly put less effort into an investigation because of the chosen profession of the victims. We have Lisa Jane Brown here in Perth and Jane Furlong over in New Zealand. I actually read a book on Jane's case quite a few years ago now. It was called The Short Life and Mysterious Death of Jane Furlong. And it is actually a terribly sad case. Jane was just 17 years old when she disappeared back in 1993. And in 2012, her remains were actually found buried on a beach but her case has never been solved. And to add even more tragedy to her case, she had a five month old son at the time that she disappeared. And before I do move on, I do want to add that although I have said it in many videos before this, on this channel, we do not shame nor do we judge sex workers. If you do, leave this video and honestly, leave my channel. There is still far too many people that believe that people that choose to, quote unquote, choose to work in the sex industry have it coming or had it coming, as if every person that gets involved in sex work had a choice. Some people are just trying to survive out there. Anyway, I've said my piece on that. So before moving on, I do want to discuss some of the rumors that actually have come up over the years regarding Ravel's disappearance. These aren't my theories or really any kind of theories. They're basically things that someone has heard from someone else and then told the police. And for the most part, they have been ruled out, but I still feel like they are worth going over in today's video. So let's get the least likely one out the way first. That Ravel was taken by an Arab prince back to Saudi Arabia. I mean, anything is possible, but this one seems kind of low on the list of possibilities. Another rumor involves something we discussed earlier, which is moonlighting. Apparently, although again, there is no proof of this. Ravel had been ripping off money from her agency, which is a big no-no in the industry. So someone had her killed. A man named Jeremy Coughlin would later come forward claiming that his friend Mark Colton had told him something along the lines of, quote, he said something like, aren't people gullible and stupid? You've heard the story about Ravel Balmain. First, there was a story about the Arab prince who took her back to Saudi Arabia. What a load of crap. She is 10 foot under and no one will ever find her body. That's what you get for moonlighting and ripping off the brothel that she worked for. And drugging clients, stealing their money, Basically, the owners of the brothel wanted her dead because she was destroying his business, end quote. Mark Colton has since denied ever saying this, although he did admit to hearing the rumor that Ravel had been murdered. And 
By the way, Mark Colton was a client of Ravel's and a very wealthy one at that, with several articles dubbing him the Palm Beach Playboy, although I had never heard of him. And the last I could actually find about him was in an article from 2017 stating that he had been sentenced to eight years in jail for drug trafficking. So yeah, not great. And I should also add that Mark Colton isn't considered a person of interest in this case. But speaking of drugs, let's just not not the best uh, segue there. Let's discuss the drug rumors. The rumors that Ravel got mixed up with the wrong crowd, that she was doing escort work to support her drug habit, or that she owed drugs or money to people. Uh, I said it in a recent video, but I'll say it again. With every baffling case like this, there is always, always a drug theory. It's it's like the rules. <laughs> Again, these are all unsubstantiated rumors that I did want to discuss because this is a case that seems to have a heck of a lot of rumors swirling around about it. And quite frankly, some of the reason that I was a little nervous to cover this case was because of these strong opinions online regarding what happened to Ravel and the characters involved. However, as a reminder, I am a neutral party discussing what is already available online. Five years after Ravel Balmain's disappearance in 1999, an inquest was held with her last client, Gavin Samers, being named as the main person of interest in her probable murder. Gavin's ex-girlfriend, Michelle Oswood Seely, who, as I mentioned before, lived with him at the time, gave a pretty interesting testimony during the inquest. Gavin and Michelle were actually together for a couple of years after Ravel's disappearance, despite the fact that he sold her clarinet to pay for a sex worker. But on the night in question, Michelle, who was away, had been trying to contact Gavin via the phone and it took her till around 9.20 p.m. to actually get a hold of him. According to Gavin, he was with Ravel from 4 p.m. till around 7, 7.30 when he dropped her off at the Red Tomato Inn before making his purchases and heading home by himself for the night to drink some more. So unless he was just ignoring his girlfriend's calls, it's also worth mentioning that Michelle claims Gavin was a pretty massive uh, alcoholic during their relationship. So I guess it's possible that he was just uh, intoxicated when she was trying to contact him. Regardless, Michelle arrived home after her weekend away and immediately noticed the same scratches that the police had noticed on Gavin's fingers and neck. She also noticed that the bed sheets had been changed and that Gavin had cleaned his car. And according to Michelle, Gavin was a pretty bloody lazy boyfriend. So this was some pretty out of character behavior for him. And speaking as someone who spent seven years living with their ex, I would be bloody well shocked to my core if I came home and the bed sheets had been changed without me asking like 10 times first. No shade to any of the great partners, male partners out there, but yeah. <laughs> if you know, you know. Having said that, of course, Gavin did have another woman in his bed and I'm assuming that maybe Michelle wasn't aware of this, but who knows? So changing the bed sheets was kind of the least that he could do. But cleaning his car? Mm, who knows? Maybe he had a burst of motivation that weekend. Uh, the back seats of the car were also down, which Gavin explained was so he could put his surfboard in the back, which makes enough sense. Anyway, aside from Gavin acting a little bit sus over that weekend, there really was no solid evidence nor any motive for him to have killed Ravel. He was simply the last known person to have seen her, making him the most obvious suspect. Of course, keep in mind, police didn't actually attempt to find any evidence at the time, so this was a pretty big screw up on their end. Plus, I will say, surely if Gavin had been involved, he would not be silly enough to leave Revel's uh, belongings scattered through his own suburb. 
right? Then we have the owner of Select Companions, Zoran Sinojevic, who was also named as a person of interest. Although, like with Gavin, there was really no proof to link him to Ravel's disappearance, although he did have possibly a motive. We don't know, though. In the end, the inquest concluded that Ravel had been murdered by an unknown person or persons, which, of course, was kind of what everybody suspected. And after the inquest concluded, Gavin Seymour actually moved to Tasmania to escape this or the negative attention that the case had brought him and would remain there working as a chef for the next 15 years. The good news is that this case is slowly but continually a Evolving, with updates happening even within the last year, which is what pushed me to discuss this case here on my channel. In May of 2021, the New South Wales Police announced a $1 million reward for any information leading to solving this case. And it was this large reward amount that led to a tip-off from a member of the public regarding the photograph that I mentioned at the start of the video of the mystery man taken around the early 2000s that I will have up on the screen now. This man apparently has some information regarding Ravel's last movements, and at least one article did claim that he has since been identified, but I couldn't find any further updates on this matter. Also in late 2021, several properties in Sydney were forensically searched for clues to Ravel's case. And again, around this time, the former owner of Select Companions, Zoran Stanojevic, was arrested on drug and theft charges. And it was announced that he was still considered a person of interest in Ravel's disappearance. So a few updates on Gavin Seymour. In mid-2019, Gavin, who was back living in Sydney by this point, was charged and convicted with assault against his flatmate, Rosalind Rosenberg, and ended up being fined $1,500 and was sentenced to a 12-month community correction order. The following year, he was charged with sexual assault against the same woman, but this charge was dropped when Rosalind died in an explosion in her apartment, which, by the way, I could not find any cause of online. Gavin does maintain his innocence to this day regarding Ravel's probable murder and his more recent charges. And of course, I am in no way suggesting he was involved in Ravel's disappearance. But if you do have any information regarding this case, please contact Crime Stoppers. The number will be on the screen and down below. But I do want to thank you so much for being here and listening to Ravel's story. And until next time, stay vigilant and stay safe.